Hello and welcome to the West Asia Post with me, Ghadi Francis. This is our weekly show where we bring you all the latest updates from the world's most volatile region. Our top story this week is about an assassination attempt. Now, West Asia is no stranger to assassinations. They make and break kingdoms and countries here. But even then, this most recent one in Iraq has taken the region by storm. Drone-laden explosives hit the house of Iraq's Prime Minister Mustafa al-Qadimi in Baghdad's highly secured green zone. Now this comes while countries' parties are scrambling to form a coalition government. We tell you more. This is Baghdad's green zone, a 10 square kilometer area in the center of the city. It is a heavily fortified zone, the center of the international presence in Iraq and the headquarters of Iraqi regimes. So when the Prime Minister's house was attacked here, all hell broke loose in the war-scarred nation. This was an assassination attempt, a move to kill Mustafa al-Kadimi. A drone laden with explosives struck his building. It injured six of his bodyguards. Parts of his residence were damaged. Doors and windows were blown out and an SUV parked outside was charred. But Kadimi escaped unhurt. Hours later, the Prime Minister addressed the nation. He appeared calm and composed, seated behind a desk in a white shirt and what appeared to be a bandage around his left wrist. Three drones were involved in the attack. Two of the drones deployed were shot down but the third managed to strike Kadimi's residence. A security video showed the damage to his residence. The car parked outside, badly mangled. A shallow crater near the stairs, cracks in the ceiling and walls of a balcony, and broken parts of the building's roof. Two unexploded rockets were filmed at the scene. Condemnation of the attack poured in from world leaders. Several called al Kadimi with words of support. President Baham Saleh called it a heinous crime against Iraq. Iran accused unnamed foreign think tanks, and the United States said that perpetrators must be held accountable. The attack came just days after elections concluded here. Iraq is currently in a long process of trying to form a governing coalition. The turnout was a record low, just around 43%. For Iraq's citizens, they think that there will be no real change. Elections and power come and go, but I think the only loser in this equation is the Iraqi citizen. The struggle is that we, of course, don't deny. It is a strong struggle over the span of eight or ten years where deep states have been rooted in the country's establishments. Iraq's political fault lines meant that tensions were high. Some in Baghdad blamed the Iran-backed militias. Others called it an internal plot to distract the public from the chaos in the country. Of course, it's a clear charade by the Prime Minister, aimed at covering up his crime and the crimes of his traitorous security leaders, who led to the killing of fighting leaders. This crime is clear and obvious to us. They are charades that have continued with us from since the first day. We ask for the ending of this comical and shameful charade. For now, there is no clear claim of responsibility, but the attack signals a new era in West Asia. An era in which non-state drones are used to target people. Drones have become an effective weapon of political violence. It began here, in Iraq itself, when the Islamic State used it during the battle for Mosul.
If the group itself is responsible for this attack, it could mean danger for Iraq's stability. It would mean a major breach of security and could serve as an unprecedented threat to state. Iraq is currently on borrowed time. It is in the middle of a government formation. Groups are fighting one another over who will reign supreme in the war-scarred nation. But with this recent drone attack, the stakes have gone up much higher. West Asia Bureau, we own. World is one. We have a lot more lined up for this edition of the West Asia Post. But first, as usual, let's take a look at what's making the headlines across West Asia. The United Arab Emirates Foreign Minister met President Bashar al-Assad in Damascus, a sign of improving ties between Assad and a US-allied Arab state. Foreign Minister Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed is the most senior Emirati official to visit Syria in the decade. Israel has approved COVID-19 vaccines for children from the age of five. This comes as a fourth wave of infections subsides across the Jewish state. Palestinian digital rights activists have accused Facebook of biased censorship. Palestinians complain that their political posts were removed or demoted, especially by Facebook and Instagram. Israel has stepped up its public opposition to the Biden administration plan to reopen a U.S. consulate for Palestinians in Jerusalem. Instead, Tel Aviv says that such a mission should be in the occupied West Bank. The United Arab Emirates has issued new rules governing divorce, inheritance and child custody for non-Muslims in Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi is one of seven sheikdoms in UAE, and the new law only affects it. Iran has freed the seized Vietnamese tanker seized after a confrontation with the US Navy. Earlier, the Revolutionary Guards said it had thwarted an attempt by the U.S. Navy to steal Iranian oil. It is the battle for the last government bastion in Yemen. Houthi rebels are advancing and the Saudi-led coalition are defending their last stronghold. But stuck in between are millions of Yemeni citizens. They are starving. They have no access to health care. Famine is just months away in the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Let's go to Yemen. They say nations win wars, but humanity loses. Words tailor-made for the crisis in Yemen. The Houthi rebels are an emboldened lot. They have launched an offensive for the last government bastion in the country. Government forces are preparing to defend Marib against the fast advancing Houthis. They are bent on taking full control of the city. That is one of Yemen's key energy producing regions. The Saudi led coalition is reporting high death tolls among the Houthis on a nearly daily basis. Death toll among the rebels have surpassed 3,000, a figure that cannot be verified. Currently, an atricious offensive is underway. The last government stronghold, it's a bloody battle. If Marib falls, Houthis will have an upper hand. But thousands of civilians in refugee camps would have to fend for themselves. At risk is a population of 3 million people, including the 1 million who fled from other parts of Yemen. 80% of those living in the camps are women and children. The humanitarian needs in the city's camps far outstrip the current humanitarian capacity on the ground.
There is a high demand amid weak and scarce capabilities of the hospital to treat patients, especially as we are ahead of winter and in this season the diseases increase very significantly. As it is well known, displaced people live in camps and this leads to an increase in the number of cases, especially in the current stage. This raises case of flu and in addition, it is the season of the coronavirus in addition to the cases of flu. What's happening in Yemen is a tit-for-tat war. Strikes followed by retaliatory strikes and then preemptive strikes. All the while, civilians on the ground watch on as firepower raises hopes of a better life. This isn't a battle for Yemen anymore. It is a theatre for the West Asian Cold War. A strip of land where Saudi Arabia and Iran can unleash a battle of egos. The Yemenis are merely pawns in this game. Expendable. Yemen is one step away from a famine. The war has killed thousands, leaving behind a conflict-ridden nation, where 80% of the population depends on aid. The UN calls it the world's worst humanitarian crisis. So where does this end? The UN is still nursing hopes of a ceasefire. But why would the Houthis take the bait, especially since they're gaining on Marid? As for the Saudis, this is the Crown Prince's personal battle, a war he pulled his country into. This to and fro will likely continue. In the end, one side will emerge victorious. But the question is, will they still have a country left to rule? West Asia Bureau, Vion, World is One. Saudi Arabia is squeezing Lebanon's economy. The kingdom has imposed blanket ban on Lebanese imports. Another blow to the country's crippled economy that is already facing multiple crises. But amid the new diplomatic row, some fear that the squeeze could get far worse. We tell you more. At a stationary factory outside Beirut, the machinery sits idle. Shifts here have been reduced. The firm was already struggling with Lebanon's financial crisis and now a diplomatic row has made things worse. It has been over 14 days since Saudi Arabia banned imported goods from Lebanon. The timing could not have been more painful. It is strapped for cash and sinking into debt. This import ban is further harming its economy. At several businesses across Lebanon, the impact is already being felt. This company had been producing books and office supplies, especially destined for Saudi Arabia. But then the ban came into force. It's as if there is a plan to break the economic and industrial sectors in Lebanon, in addition to cutting the ties and connections between Lebanon and the world, and especially the Gulf and Saudi Arabia. Non-food Lebanese exports to Saudi Arabia include aluminium, gold, machinery, soaps and paints. The current ban from Riyadh will directly hit around $250 million worth of exports. Riyadh once invested billions of dollars into the country, helping Lebanon bolster its tourism economy. Lebanese businesses have been battered by crises that were compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic and a massive explosion at Beirut port last year. The Lebanese pound depreciated by more than 90% since 2019, slashing the purchasing power of locals. Then in April, Saudi Arabia blocked imports of Lebanese agricultural products. This was after a spike in drug smuggling. Riyadh said Lebanon had failed to address the problem. The crisis with Saudi Arabia started around six months ago with the pomegranate. They stopped importing food products and the situation is still aggravating. We were trying to solve it in any way possible, but things got complicated again. Saudi Arabia is a very important market for us and it should be solved soon. Lebanon is highly dependent on exports and diaspora remittances to generate revenue. 
remittances average about 15 to 20 percent of Lebanon's GDP annually, with about 43 percent coming from the Gulf states. So a clash with the Gulf nations is not ideal. Many fear that the UAE, Kuwait and Bahrain could follow Saudi Arabia's lead. That would mean a similar blanket ban on all goods imported from Lebanon. For now, Lebanon remains caught in a regional rivalry, one that could speed up its economic freefall. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. Olive trees have been cultivated in Palestine for centuries. They are often seen as the sign of Palestinian resistance. But in recent years, olive sector has been hit. First, there were settler attacks on Palestinian olive farmers. Then, there was climate change. Palestinian olive farmers are now dealing with a lower yield. Let's go to Palestine and check it out. Olives. The small, green or black stone fruits are almost synonymous with Palestine. Olive trees have been planted here for centuries, but this year they are facing a dual attack, settlers and climate change. The harvest season is between October and November every year. About 80,000 to 100,000 Palestinian families rely on this. The harvest also employs over 15 percent women. In a good year, the olive harvest is worth between 160 to 191 billion US dollars. It is almost like a festive season for Palestinians. But since 1967, olive trees here have faced attacks. They have been uprooted by authorities in occupied territories. Settlers have burned and even destroyed them. Many farmers even need Israeli permits to cultivate. The settler attacks have grown in the recent years. During the 2020 harvest season, over 1,700 trees were vandalized. The other enemy is climate change. It is impacting the iconic gnarled trees that have shaped the holy land for centuries. Dalal Sawalme raked her fingers through the silvery green leaves of her family's trees, but not as many olives were cascading to the ground. This year, her trees produce less than half their usual yield. The once reliable two-year olive cycle has been disrupted. Some have turned to using expensive tools. Others are using irrigation to maximize their yield. This olive season isn't very good. It didn't bring anyone to help me because I can't pay for help. It's just the family working with me. We're trying to cut back as much as we can. For Palestinians, Olives are sacred. They don't just cultivate it, they treat it as a part of their identity. It is almost a symbol of Palestinian resistance. One that is facing a dual blow right now. West Asia Bureau, we are World is One. The Dead Sea is one of the saltiest bodies of water in the world. It has a salinity rate of 34%. But the Dead Sea is dying. Its waters are vanishing at an alarming rate. And with each passing year, more sinkholes are appearing on its shores. Let's take a look. In the heyday of the Ain Gedi Spa in 1960s, holidaymakers would first marinate in heated pools. They would then take a dip in the Dead Sea. Now, the spa no longer exists and the same beach is punctured by craters. The Dead Sea is a spectacular expanse of water, located in the desert, flanked by cliffs. But since 1960, it has lost a third of its surface area. The blue water recedes about a meter every year, leaving behind a lunar landscape. Whitened by salt and perforated with gapping holes. Every single day you see the decline, and uh, and you know the decline is happening on the other side as well. So at some point, it's all going to be dry. The kind of two dry up points are going to meet in the middle, and you might be lucky to have a, a channel of water mm. left that people will be able to put their toes in. But you'll have lots of sinkholes. 
The sinkholes are nearly 33 feet deep, a testament to the shrinking sea. Receding water leaves behind underground salt deposits. Runoff water dissolves these salt patches. Without support, the land above then collapses. What once used to be a thriving tourist complex is now a ghost town here. The pavement is gutted, the lampposts are overturned and it is disfigured by craters. See all the signs? You can't go there because it's really dangerous because of the sinkhole and because of the sand is really, you can sink it. But as a kid, we used to go to the spa next to the sea. Mm -hmm. There's no sea, there's no next. <laughs> It's like three kilometers from here. There are now thousands of sinkholes all around the shores of the Dead Sea in Jordan, Israel and the occupied West Bank. Human polices and water management are to blame. Both Israel and Jordan diverted the waters of the River Jordan for agricultural and drinking water. Chemical companies have extracted minerals from the sea water and climate change has further accelerated evaporation. In June, Jordan abandoned a long stalled proposal. This was to build a canal with Israel and the Palestinians to carry water from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. Instead, Amman said that it would build a desalination plant to solve its own drinking water crisis. But even if the canal had been built, it could not have saved the lake on its own. Scientists say that uh, you cannot uh, stop it for the next hundred years. It will continue no matter what we do. So is the Dead Sea doomed to evaporate? That's what scientists believe. The decline could go on for at least the next hundred years. Sinkholes will keep spreading over the century. However, there is a silver lining. The lake could reach a point of stability. Once its surface decreases, the water becomes saltier, thus slowing down evaporation here. But for now, the decline looks inevitable. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. West Asia is full of beauty, culture and oddities. This is why in our next segment, Curiosities, we bring you some heartwarming stories from the region. That's all we have for you on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup, bringing you more stories and updates as usual from the world's most volatile region. Until then, stay safe. I'm Redi Francis, coming to you from Beirut, and you're watching Weon. World is one.